So let me now introduce you to our first presenter of session two. He's a senior professor of chemical and process engineering at the University of Moratua. He obtained his PhD from the University of Cambridge and has worked at University of Reading, UK and Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore, India. Uh, his experience includes serving as a science team leader in the Sri Lanka Institute of Nanotechnology and as the project director at the Coordinating Secretariat for Science, Technology and Innovation, Ministry of Science, Technology and Research. Ladies and gentlemen, he's a member of the Intellectual Property Advisory Commission, Sri Lanka, and a member of the Governing Council of National Occupational Health and Safety Institute, Ministry of Labor, and also a founder director of the Sri Lanka Green Building Council. His interests are in uh, eco-innovations, food process engineering, environmental engineering, nanobiotechnologies, bioenergy systems. The founder president of Lanka Biogas Association and a fellow of the National Academy of Science at Sri Lanka. Ladies and gentlemen, put your hands together for Professor Ajit Dialvis. Hi, everyone. Uh, and uh, first of all, let me thank Professor Mrs. Ratnayaka, President of ISL and the Council, for the, the invitation made to make a presentation in this important uh, national conference. So uh, my task is on nanomaterials, contribution to national economic development. Um, I must admit at the outset, it's, t it's a still a task in the making, but um, there are things that are right now happening. So I will touch upon, uh, just to excite you on the, uh, the opportunities that we have and um, the necessities like uh, the message um, that from a manufacturing and processing angle that we really should take some risk and um, some initiatives need to happen if you are to really truly make the national economic uh, benefit. But it's, um, if you do that, it will be a huge opportunity that's await. So really, um, it's 2007 and eight. This is, if you take the yesterday part of this uh, theme, um, nanotechnology in Sri Lanka really started with some um, serious championing by a few individuals. Uh, specifically, it's like um, Professor Sirimali, of chairperson of National Science Foundation, and uh, then, of course, then the Science and Technology Minister, Professor Tista Vitarana. And it was in the era of 2007 and 8, and um, quite a few Sri Lankan scientists who have had experience in nanotechnology did join, and also some expatriate uh, scientists who actually gave their time voluntarily to ensure that this did happen. But there was still a very big question what you do, do with nanotechnology, we sometimes cannot cross the road comfortably. Uh, so there was this um, side question always asked, why do we engage in the state of the art or rather the emerging technology? Um, are we really um, uh, selecting something that is not quite right? So the 2008, um, it happened and interestingly 2010, one of the best in, uh, intellectual property capturing on this did happen. So um, from an idea to establishment and then to realization on an intellectual property gain uh, did happen in a very short period of time thanks to some um, in a very good commitment of in this particular patent, the four scientists, four researchers, from two from University of uh, Peradeniya and two from University of Sri Jayawardenepura. And also it did happen with a very unique public-private partnership which uh, World Bank, uh, Dr. Mashelka was a World Bank consultant and who recorded on this initiative as a, the initiative has been laid on a foundation of a unique public-private partnership. And I believe that still in the nanotechnology area, uh, because always when something new um, is happening, even if you take the United States, the President Clinton signed the uh, year 2000, it always have been federal funds or government funds. But in this case, government did not really move forward unless the private sector was prepared to have a 50-50 partnership. And in Sri Lanka, that did happen. So pre uh, paving the way for a very unique uh, public-private partnership for the first time across the globe, more or less, uh, in nanotechnology establishment. So this is where it happened uh, 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 in the, one of the MAS uh, factories basement. True to the word of nanotechnology, there's plenty of room at the bottom. The, the, 
the flow at the, uh, the lowest level was given to the establishment of the laboratory to start the operation. So the infrastructure was not, from building point, it was straight away available, and uh, scientists had the chance to engage uh, immediately with some work. So this is uh, also to do with nanomaterials, but um, of course, at Bia Gamma, the, uh, the um, scientists, researchers did create the synthetically the nanomaterial uh, they used for this slow release fertilizer, even though what we have at a power, because I'm relating to all the resources that we have in Sri Lanka, and the poten demonstrate the potential. So the hydroxyapatite, we have it, but uh, in this particular case, they did synthesize hydroxyapatite and use it um, um, in the urea formulation, urea with urea, and um, that's the way uh, managed to give this slow release fertilizer. And um, the idea was to get about 40 to 50 percent reduction in urea application, um, and it has been proven, um, and um, it's some trials which still the agriculture ministry is going on, but what lacks is perhaps sometimes the energy and some championing of let's, let's do this um, in a much more um, focused manner and get the benefit, because if you can think, if you can reduce the urea budget, the budget for urea, and um, you don't need um, uh, broadcasting the fertilizer two times. Uh, there are some huge benefits, and also the yield goes up, and so on. So these are, these are kind of proven at a very research level, and even at Batalagoda RRI. Uh, so um, the potential is very high, and uh, the, um, the return on investment technically on the research is very, very high. Um, so that's something what we need, and I'll continue to mention about the need for championing and to take some risk and some uh, good decision making to benefit from this type of technology advances. So interestingly, um, this particular one re really realized the attention of the Indian company, Nagarjuna, the reason being that Sri Lanka didn't have a urea facility. We had one at some point, and that was closed down and shipped elsewhere. Um, so with a major loss from a chemical industry point of view. And, um, but Indian said, look, you have done only the laboratory work. Uh, we have a urea facility. And uh, you can't exploit it, we can. But they were insisting, and it was very interesting that even the Indian ambassador came when this technology uh, patent intellectual property transfer took place. It was for a value of about 3.1 million US dollars. Um, and that was exactly the investment, more or less, what the government did for the entire Stintec at the time. So four scientists, four researchers, with uh, some decent idea and input, actually created a situation where you can get with that effort, 3.1 mi uh, million um, US dollars. So that's the kind of thing that we are talking about, the potential, when we really add value um, to resources. So the national economic impact, today is we have this major research center at Homagama. Uh, Sri Lanka is a nanotechnology, and it is one of the uh, top green buildings in the world in the green building laboratories, um, because this is a Leeds Platinum facility, and in the top 2% of laboratories, those who have got Leeds Platinum. So fairly a unique environment to work with, and um, with the tech city, this is going to be a, an ecosystem in itself in um, various technologies, uh, including um, nanotechnology and now biotechnology coming in and mechatronics, etc. Uh, so it's an interesting developments that are taking place. The basic theme is, you do your research, but more do the applied research. And I have taken this from actually from a German company, BASF, and just put the Sri Lanka in the middle. So this, is the, this has been their philosophy. The idea is to say that we should have this philosophy as well. Maybe not immediately the basic part, but somebody has to do some of these things. But definitely the applied research. But the applied research should lead to uh, innovation, protection, and exploitation of patents. Um, the intellectual property um, capture, because with IP, you can actually, in this globalized world, um, that's the way to do if it's, you're going to look at commercialization. So one of the advisors today is it's not publish or perish, but it is first patent and then publish. And also, you select areas that have a potential for patentability. So you don't uh, take a research just because I want to complete something to finish off some uh, research and I have to do a research anyway. It's not with that mindset, but just think about 
um, area that I know that what I am doing, I can advance something and I am doing something fairly unique and um, so on. So first of all, in the idea itself, when you select, it's very important we select the right thing. I mean, we consistently say that Sri Lankan universities, we have about 20,000 projects at any time. And if even 50% of those projects are being targeted to problem solving and in, in this manner, there can be a huge benefit. Um, that's something we see now. So uh, that is more resilient wealth to an economy rather than sometimes the mechanics that we adopt in wealth creation because even 100,000 tourists in one season may come, a volcano may erupt, and the next season they may not come. So that's not adding to a resilient economy. But this type of process actually develops a resilient economy. And as a result of some of these ideas, these are three columns that I wrote at one point some time back, that Sri Lanka can actually be termed a treasure island in nano times because we have so much opportunities in nanomaterials, um, so it's virtually a treasure island, right? But we st still seem not to understand this. And also the um, former granary of the East can be rekindled uh, with nanotechnology or rather with nano. And then of course the dark sands of Fulmude, which is rich with titanium and um, um, so on, and that's another nano opportunity. So these hit, um, some of these columns were written just to get uh, the public, or we were communicating on science from Slintech, and the idea with that there's so much of opportunity that we have, and the decision makers need to be aware of this opportunity. And also, the, while the economists were preaching uh, knowledge-based economics per se, uh, we were actually stressing that why not combine the resource-based economies with knowledge-based economies. That is, we have our resources and we have this new science knowledge and we can contribute in that. So put that together, that can be much, much more stronger. And I will show you as a last example, the potential of that, right? And thinking like that, because we tell, no, no, we don't, can't now, the days of resource-based economies are over. We are on a service base, we, we have to have more services. And our economies do come with that argument. But um, again, adding resilience, this can be a better way of doing things as a development paradigm uh, for Sri Lanka. So we actually push uh, identified material platforms in nanotechnology, and what you find is uh, silver, carbon, titanium, silica, zinc, and gold are major areas um, that, because the, these materials do play a big role, and if you look at the entire periodic table, um, there are still only few that have been exploited with l potential that maybe they are in so many more. Uh, but silver dominates, but I won't stress silver considering that we are not actually into that. But carbon, titanium, and silica are straight away three things that Sri Lanka can work on. Um, and um, I can give you an, uh, in general value, it's like, I'll talk about the values, but what you see here is titanium 10 grams at 11,000, but carbon nanotubes, uh, with special structures, we have actually paid at the laboratory level five milligrams, one lakh eighty-five thousand, right? So that's a huge, um, you know, from an analytical point of view, a significant value addition that you can get. So what we said was, yes, you have to be a material supplier in the first instant, then drive down to get materials into the, the industry side and actually uh, work on that. So uh, what, uh, identified, what we identified to highlight were five areas, what we called as five nano material platforms to the country. Uh, and basically one is Ilbanite based on Pulmude, which has the best deposit. You have it on the, uh, our western west coast as well, but the east coast has the best deposit and one of the world's best. And one thing you find is whatever the minerals that Sri Lanka has, we have the very best quality. But unfortunately this very best quality we just sell it and then get some returns, but that's about it, but others do exploit it, and um, then subsequently we may buy one or two pieces of those materials, that's about all. So, and then Murunkan, we have a huge uh, clay deposit, which is a, one of the best, again, nano clay deposits on Mount Marlite. Um, and again, it's under paddy field, so there are ways, uh, you have to look at how to make the right decision, but there's this very significant dis, uh, deposit, the very huge deposit. And then Martale to start with nanomagnetite, and then 
Matale, uh, Matale and Ratnapur again on silica, but with silica we can also work with paddy husk and so on. So nano silica root uh, can be either an inorganic root or a mineral based root or a, a organ, a food um, with a kind of crop based root as well. And both roots have been proven. Um, and then Bogala Kahatagaha is the nano graphite. Right, so you have your graphite and you had to work towards the nano part. But nano clay being an exception, that's nature gives us in nano format. So these five material platforms, what can, that, what can they do? Now that's the interesting point and I highlight only uh, one or two. So that if you take those five, um, five platforms, uh, except for clay, we do exploit the rest, but we just send them as just washed clean um, material. That's what we do. Pulmude, we clean it. Japanese gave us the, uh, the processing mill basically free of charge, so we keep the pollution and release the mineral sand to the outside. Um, and similarly, um, we crush quartz and give the quartz to the outside, the computers and the stuff happen. And almost all these things are 99.9% .9 pure. And anyone who understands mineral processing understand the value of 5% mineral content to 99% that content because it basically has the most polluting part completely gone. It's not necessary to do because we have the best of the mineral. Um, so value addition possibilities are it's like from clay one is to 16, and uh, even in our medical system, we still bring some of these clays for toxic um, things to be taken out for adsorption. So we bring it from outside as certain value. So you can see one is to 16, one is to 40, one is to 500, one is to 1,000, and one is to 25,000 value addition opportunity, right? The 25,000 comes when it comes to the graphite, uh, to the graphene range, um, and there it is, we still may not know the potential possi uh, the possibility. So you can see at the moment we are just selling kilogram at a value, and if you had even five milligrams of that value added thing, that, that is the value addition that you can expect. And you have to understand the economic opportunity if you go down this pathway. But uh, decisions are needed because technically it's not just uh, next day you can't, even though you understand the value, next day you can't do that because people are not ready to do with technology transfer in the, these conditions because the moment we start value adding, the economies that are benefiting at this stage need to buy stuff from us. And they're not going to look at this type of FDIs are not very much coming to the country, right? More are interested only in uh, securing the uh, uh, securing the uh, op the, uh, the resource. Like we have graphite mine now owned by uh, Germany. So this is Pulmude and uh, Trinco area. So you have the black sands, and what is very interesting is at one point the ground reality is we sell about. Um, and just an example, we sell about 80,000 metric tons per year, dutifully washed and bagged to the Japan or any country. And we get about, um, this is not the very current prices, I will come with the one current price, 8 million US dollars. That's what we get for the 80,000 metric tons. And then uh, we bring 5,000 metric tons of titanium dioxide, TiO2 pigment for maybe main, main, mainly for paints and then even toothpaste and stuff. Uh, we spent 12.5 million dollars. So the point is, we have been selling 80,000 sand and buying 5,000 of the product, and our 8 million is straight away vanished because we are spending now 12.5 uh, million US dollars. But because our quality of our raw material is so good, is actually one, two metric tons can give one metric ton of TIA2. So the potential that is possible and the current and the price range, if we convert that 80,000 to a 40,000 TIO2, it's about 100 million US dollars straight away. Now you can imagine the, the benefits to be had. So that is just titanium dioxide pigment. So if you do that with nano titanium, in 2011, the ratios were like one is to 40 to 500. Remember, we are now at the one stage. It's like one kilo at one dollar. But if you have nano titanium dioxide one, uh, one kilo, we are going to get $500. That's the price ratio, the value ratio that is there from the market value. Um, I was just checking yesterday, just to get a rough one before the event, 2018, uh, prices have will come down. So TIO2 is 
basically half, but you can see nano has not really shifted. But even if you take Alibaba, you are going to see about 8,000 product varieties from the just the TIO2 nano and TIO2. So the various grades, anatase, rutile, certain different crystal structures, and then for cosmetics, paints, photocatalytic, etc. there's a huge variation. And at the moment, just imagine, we are selling one of the best quality deposits at washed sand price, right? Um, so it, it's so, so, um, such a thing is happening. And it was nice again, um, as a result of a discussion, um, there was, again, um, private sector came forward to set up a factory, initially the pilot plant. So you have the pilot plant now at Homagama, and, um, and of course, what we say is, you need more championing that country should be more aware, the decision makers, we have a roadmap for nanomaterials, we have a roadmap for nanotitanium dioxide, and it has to happen within five years. I mean, that, some, that aspect is missing in our decision making. Um, so some are championing the cause, some have come together, but it has been a very hard road uh, for nanotitanium dioxide and TiO2. So this is the pilot plant. We have not moved into the uh, production plant at all. And um, so these are, this is one of the end, because in the same time, there are again discussions can happen on the side how to get the deposits away, right? Because that's quick, um, what do you call it, a quick return, quick return on the investment, uh, non-investment basically. And also the nanotechnology scientists have further worked on like, um, now all this is patent driven because Nobody is really, really supporting with technology transfer, so you had to do some of your own work, and then you suddenly find something new. That's what is interesting, because otherwise you won't get your own patent. So again, there was a patent uh, that came up from Slintech on hydrophobic surface treatment, which is applicable on textiles initially and other things, uh, using titanium precursors. So this again based on the same material, and you can see this 2013, this patent was transferred to a local industry to lung chem. And similarly, some um, similar patents have happened with nanomaterials uh, in magnetite and uh, magnetite, for instance, but that has not been commercialized yet. And magnetite comes in MRI and imaging and even nanomedicine in targeted drug delivery. Uh, so there was a huge value added and you don't need tons of stuff. Even a kilo that if you transfer sometimes having the technology, it gives you good, uh, 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 good returns. So the, uh, what didn't really happen, and that's where the real economic benefit happened, we were expecting some sort of a decision, and this was something we pushed at the time, for a new era of industrialization. And one critical one was to have a sulfuric acid plant, uh, but we were expecting it's possible within a three years, uh, the, because the payback, but you need to put an initial capital, but if you look at 100 million type of opportunity with 40,000 metric tons, the returns on titanium was fast, but the initial capital and expenditure and the risk part uh, was that uh, didn't really happen. So we are still stuck at that level. And as I say, um, so we, even while this type of research and development goes on, another sector will work on cash is in on the export of mineral sands. And even media will publicly report that we lack, uh, we lack human resources and um, as well as necessary expertise. So it is quite sad, in the same economy, same environment, in a small country, we report on two different things, and uh, in, in parallel. But this uh, is the decisions. Others are some scientists and engineers working in a corner that's not getting the same attention. So uh, just to quickly, um, uh, so this, this is what needs to be changed. And similarly, you have with silica and uh, and you have not, uh, uh, the pains uh, which can be produced for thermal insulation, which now can be applied, and you can imagine the energy efficiency effects that can be done. Now we buy those pains, but the basis is uh, nanosilica, right? And nanosilica can come from some of these biomass operations, and it's only uh, one industry process away. And uh, so these few processes that are really necessary, and with lack backed by uh, by the, having a uh, process like sulfuric acid uh, is missing in the decision making and that stops the real economic benefits to be had. Because you need some of these things to happen in parallel uh, if you are to make the benefits. Similarly for that fertilizer, 
Um, there are still trials going on, but we have not capitalized on, we are never telling our urea requirement has finally come down. We don't say that, right? It's a hot topic in a sense, how do you give the subsidy? How do you distribute this, etc. cetera? But when, when, the, when the opportunity is there with innovation on reducing the demand, we are not realizing, we are not really moving out in that direction. And finally, just to highlight on uh, something that is exciting from another venture that has happened, because here the scientist has the entrepreneurial um, backing and also the mindset. Um, so we're in graphite, right? So this is a short story. Um, I'm taking actually from the industrial list, so I owe my um, appreciation for sharing some of this information, and of course for them doing it, and I thought, this is an opportunity to introduce uh, something that is happening because Sri Lanka has now turned into the eighth country in the world that is uh, uh, having the ability to export um, what is called graphene oxide and reduced graphene oxide and exfoliated graphite, etc. And that is a unique development. Uh, and again, a public-private partnership has come in as a result of that initial Slintec beginning because what is interesting is we have pristine vein graphite, uh, and what we have been doing is, um, interestingly, we had the first cancers in the lung from occupational disease from this very industry. Sri Lankan safety laws came because of this industry in graphite mines, because we had about 3,000 graphite mines, and you can see the, the, the labor uh, were just crushing them, and, and there was a lot of carbon dust and stuff, and the pneumoconiosis was taking place in the lungs of the, uh, the miner. And so this has a diff the, that side of history too in the country. But what we have been doing so far is we have been have, uh, s uh, selling a unique resource that only Sri Lanka possess. That's not even titanium can boast of it. We say high quality, but this is the only deposit of this type in the world. And it's sometimes unbelievable to see, maybe the geologist can tell us the reason how this happened in Sri Lanka in a small 65,000 square kilometer and no other country in the world has this much of thing. So we, um, so it's interesting, we don't, no other country has been graphite. They have graphite, but they are amorphous and the rust. So, um, and I'll show you, so what we have been doing is this pristine quality. Of course, the science paved the way for the knowledge. Um, the, we were selling it about, if you look at the Asbury ca catalog, you may find 200, uh, 200 rupees, one kilogram we have been selling. And I showed, I told you, carbon nanotube, uh, fullerenes that we bought, five milligrams, we had to pay 185,000, right? So such price structures are there. And one thing that has excited some of our uh, uh, raw material manufacturer producers is, uh, in the world market, because this is still pure, um, even though people have not at that point understood about graphene, if you take Mexican graphite, was selling 49 US dollars a ton, Normal market price for about 648, but Sri Lankan vein graphite was 932 without anything but just, just being uh, Sri Lankan vein graphite because of a, uh, is this quality factor, right? So the commodity had a superior position in the market, even though globally we were not a major producer in a large scale, um, most of the other countries were doing, but there was value. But today, with all these battery technologies, lithium, hydride, um, li lithium batteries, and all these electric cars, it's interesting because graphite, even though people talk or don't talk about it, the lithium is the one that's highlighted, but there's 20, 30% more graphite in those things. And um, a quality graphite is much more desired by the battery people. And also to note that when 2010 physics Nobel Prize was won by a Manchester Russian scientist, um, it was for graphene, that is getting a layer of uh, this single atom carbon out, and then showing that all this flexible electronics uh, and so much, with it's, uh, it's, as you can see, it is thinner than, uh, it's a single atom thick anyway, talking about it, that's the graphene, that's the ultimate, but it's much stronger than steel. And we talk about uh, maybe carbon structures, the Arthur Clarke's uh, space elevator may come from, not by just graphene, but maybe from the carbon nanotube as, the, as currently the only feasible material, the strength, et cetera, and so on. So you can see the graphene, which was the unique one, and Europe, European Union is spending one billion euros across 27 countries as a major research project on graphene because they believe graphene is a wonder material of the 21st century. Uh, so 
the, there's enormous opportunity yet to identify it in some, but having identified it in some, you can see from long life batteries, solar panels, construction, the memory chips, smartphone screens, they are, they are quite popular, water filters, uh, some talk about desalination becoming very cost effective as a result of some of these things, certainly with CNT, and smart plasters, etc. There's so many things that are on the horizon. Um, the research is happening, and um, so this is big, big opportunity, right? And what's also happening is sometimes external companies like this getting an ownership of Sri Lankan graphite and claiming on the, the uniqueness of the thing, their stock market prices go up. It automatically happens when they see on the day list on the sh uh, sh uh, stock market and say, look, now we have acquired some rights in Sri Lanka uh, over the, um, uh, the graphite. And, um, and um, so this, uh, this is significant happening with some of the outside, whereas we really are not understood the benefit. But fortunately, this story has changed. So that's good. And also, you can see in the graphene oxide that the Slintec has produced, uh, the highest despacing has been identified, the value ever recorded in the world. So from a scientific point of view, it's really pushing the frontier because the graphene oxide that came, and incidentally, must mention, Sri Lankan graphite was what was used in initial Brody experiment when they studied this, and also when Otto Hahn went on for his uh, nuclear fission and experiment which won him the Nobel Prize, the moderator in that reactor, on the table benchtop reactor, was Sri Lankan graphite. So uh, kind of, we have provided everybody to achieve Nobel Prizes, uh, but the point is uh, our economy has not moved on other than having pneumoconiosis. So um, this is something to be transformed. So it's nice to see the Sri Lankan Research Institute, nanotechnology, identifying unique properties, and then um, coming up with this um, uh, situation. And so we have today a very unique partnership came with about uh, LOLC, because a scientist was there as a researcher, um, as a financial officer too, so that was beneficial. But LOLC took a very quick decision to invest and produce one of the Sri Lanka's first graphene manufacturing sites. Um, so that's a big, big beginning. And uh, so today you have it. It's a $2 million investment. And what they feel is they feel very confident about the returns. It's not like that one to 20 to 400. This has much more potential. Um, in terms of value addition, and they have cracked the technology pathway too, which again is based on a Slintec patent. So Slintec has secured the US patent on this production, uh, modified Hummer method, and et cetera, et cetera. And uh, so that patent is, uh, is what that is getting exploited commercially between LOLC and Slintec, which I think and it's an 80%, 20% uh, ownership. So the Slintec, partners come, Slintec partnership comes from the intellectual property sharing. Uh, in that. So it's a very unique thing and very interesting to see suddenly Sri Lanka is sponsoring something in USA, right? So uh, they are, they are, they, this company will sponsor the Global Graphene Expo in USA in the coming month in October. And it's interesting because if you look at the website, uh, you can see Ceylon Graphene Technologies joins them, the uh, this international company as corporate member and a graphene sponsor in USA. And I hope you can read the lettering. And it's about 1.5 metric tons per year production. So in nanotechnology, we don't talk about 100 metric tons per day. We talk about 1.5 metric tons per year, right? But the value is what is above the roof and closer to the sky. And that's where the benefit comes. So you can have nice, small, compact plants producing small quantities, but having an enormous value. Um, but the point is, it is supported by the intellectual property that has been captured, so you can contest anybody out there who exploit it. So that is, a that is the beauty of it. You don't need mega investment, and this is a chemical pathway to get um, graphene oxide, graphite oxide, reduced graphene oxide, etc. So f I will close with that, and um, to go back on the, the last slide is, go back on what the Honorable Minister probably mentioned too, I think, um, which has been the motto of Costi. Uh, we continuously say two, two mottos we have in Costi. That is the one is uh, uh, of Munidas Kumar Tunga's statement, the nation which does not create new things will not rise, right? His second sentence is also in his kavya, it's very interesting. Uh, so, hinga kama bariunada lagi gaya maragi, or I mean, some, uh, it's a very, that, that's a situation now we are almost facing as a country. 
Uh, so, but the way out is doing things creatively and coming out with new things. But we really need to have a manufacturing mindset. It's very, very important. We shy away from manufacturing. We, want, um, we don't take that risk part. There's more capital involved initially, but the returns are high. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Alvis, uh, for uh, making all the audience aware of the importance of uh, nanotechnology as well as uh, the applications and potential. And uh, once again, uh, thank you very much. I now have the pleasure of inviting our second presenter in this uh, very meaningful second session. Uh, he is a chartered civil engineer who graduated from the University of Moritiba in 1996. He joined Central Engineering Consultancy Bureau after his graduation as a civil engineer, and since then has been working there, and at present is the Deputy General Manager of Civil Works. He obtained his Master of Engineering in Foundation Engineering in 2015, and he has done a series of research on cement-stabilized soil blocks during his professional career, and the thesis submitted for the Master of Engineering was based on the research done on performance of compressed soil blocks as foundation material. He did a series of research on manufacture of cement stabilized soil blocks locally in the context of rural engineering and to innovate a manually operated machine to produce cement stabilized soil blocks under the direction of Central Engineering Consultancy Bureau of Sri Lanka and the National Engineering Research and Development Center of Sri Lanka. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure in inviting engineer Sanjeeva Wichesinger. So, uh, thank you very much for your kind uh, introduction. And uh, Madam President, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, Firstly, I wish to thank, sincerely thank to engineer Professor Mrs. Ratnayaka uh, to, for giving me this opportunity to deliver a speech at this forum. And as, as well as, I must uh, thank to my uh, chairman of CECB, Mr. Priya Tilaka, as well. Uh, he has opened this opportunity to me as well. So when I was requested to talk about the year study, uh, sorry. Uh, uh, I thought that uh, without talking about today, the situation of the today, uh, there is no meaning to talking about the history because of now we are facing uh, some kind of crisis situation. That's why we need to uh, look back to our uh, engineering heritage or yesterday to get something uh, from our engineering heritage. So as I contain our engineering heritage model is fundamentally incompatible with the dominant one today. It is important to understand why. So thus, I will try to first examine the model of development currently what we practice or endorsed by mainline economists. And having done that exercise in the current model, I will take some time uh, to explain our engineering heritage. So today, the whole world is facing a tremendous crisis. It's not a secret. This is spread all over the aspects of our life, not only us, but as well as other species as well. So unlimited, uh, under the circumstances, even uh, without facing to the problem that unlimited wants and desires of the humankind ordered by their underdevelopment mind and uh, through uncontrolled senses are being attempted to be satisfied by using the available limited resources without uh, considering its consequences. So, and 
the goal of the present development with respect to economy, society, and environment is governed by the model represented by the West. And it is a man-centered one. This Western development model provides standards for the rest of the world to follow offer in a panacea for the problems of human beings. So when we consider our environment, they, under this development structure, environment is treated merely as a resource pool. It does not consider the human beings are as a part of ecology, and it persists control over the environment. When we look at the situations, especially uh, the changes happened during the last century, it is very clear that the, with the starting of a series of physical activities based on fossil fuels, it is very clear that the environment parameters have got changed dramatically. So we must understand that we live, and live, we live in an ecosystem which is close material-wise and resources are finite. To, for, to further expand this development process, resources have to be exploited more and more from the ecosystem, which is finite, burdening with its waste to the ecosystem. So under these circumstances, there is a dialogue in the society what we can't go for a sustainable development. What is the sustainability? There are series of definitions I found. Time time it has changed, but uh, now it is talking about the respect for nature, universal human rights, economic justice, and culture of uh, peace as well. So my question is, is it possible a sustainable development? I mean, the present development structure. Can we achieve to the sustainable state while proceeding with the, rest, with the present development? Let us look at the main characteristics of the present development, the expansion of, expansion of production at a level of increase in pace and distribution, transport are all involved, and more and more physical activities based on fossil fuels. Non-physical activities are coming down uh, with the start of using uh, fossil fuels. This is a very notable thing that uh, more and more physical activities are in the societies based on coal fossils and all other old uh, energy sources as well. Accordingly, the system is highly irreversible and highly energy wasting. Accordingly, we will have to face energy degradation and highly non cyclic You can ask me, why? What's the problem? Why we can't proceed with this development with more accurate and highly advanced technology with the support of solar or some other uh, resources or with so-called green power, is it possible? To think about, I would like to present this uh, a picture to you that this is a very abstract thing to understand the situation. This is very high-tech automated system run with fuel fossils and as well as uh, solar power and other things, and which is operated in a desert. There's no any biological activities. Think about this situation, this is a very ab abstract situation. Under such condition, could you imagine this situation? How long it could survive? Then can you compare situation uh, uh, with full of biological activities? Which could survive? Accordingly, to achieve the sustainable state, 
processes should be cyclic and irreversibility should be limited within allowable limits. So as engineers, we know this uh, delta value is a uh, measure of uh, disorderness, entropy, entropy, according to the uh, second law of the th thermodynamics. And if more activities are involved in, then uh, especially based on fossil fuels, within, with, uh, with the uh, fossil fuels are coming into the picture, there are more and more activities are going on. From the, from the beginning as well, ex, uh, uh, extracting, dis, uh, distributing, purification, and uh, using various places. So, accordingly, the situation are going to uh, more and more disorder uh, situation. So sustainable state, we live, uh, as I said, we live in, in an ecosystem which is close and finite, accordingly, Prominence should be given to the biological activities. If we want to sustain as a sustainable state, and the biological activities are basically based on soil water ecosystem driven externally uh, by sun and moon. That's why I used a term uh, terminology in my synopsis, the sustainable development is self-contradictory. So new model governed by the rule of sufficiency. Can I suggest sufficiency is merely enough is enough. Could we envision such a new model based on our Sri Lankan engineering heritage? To exist till sun and moon exist, not till this century and that century. To exist till sun and moon exist. So main sources are sun and moon. Sun represents supply of energy, and moon represents circulation water within biological entity. This is a very common uh, uh, saying in our culture that irahanda pavati turu pavati nata. So uh, when we research in our engineering heritage, most fascinating two characteristics are met that are self-regulation and self-adjustability in accordance with the nature and its changes. So I will start my uh, presentation on our engine heritage uh, from this point. When we talk about the self-adjustable uh, self, uh, adjustable uh, characteristics, we will meet our soil water ecosystem here yeah, I, I uh, limit my presentation to the dry zone, that is basically Rajarata zone. Almost all the streams are seasonable, seasonal streams and Mahavali river is flowing by one side. Uh, can get bright uh, sunlight and during the year and dry zone. And bedrock is very close to the earth's surface and <coughs> water retaining capacity of soil is very low. So how this kind of dry zone become a wet zone, how it is converted by our ancestors. So this is a very typical diagram uh, to represent the soil water ecosystem. The, uh, this is, uh, uh, if we consider the, our uh, tank system, uh, you, uh, basically uh, Mahavau and uh, uh, Gumwell are there. Basically, Mahavel uh, is a large tank where it used to collect water drained through uh, uh, various catchments as well as uh, uh, water collected from uh, diversion uh, by Amuna. Then this uh, water was released through the Biso Kotwa Sorova uh, to the downstream of the tank from which the water was fed to the, uh, fed to the uh, interconnected clusters of uh, cascades uh, of village level small and medium sized rivers. This, that ca cascades are, consist of uh, various size of small tanks. So uh, 
then the paddy fields were fed from this uh, village. Uh, and after that, then a certain amount of water is released to the downstream or lower, uh, lower tanks uh, in the Langawa over the, uh, its wana uh, uh, or spill. And this Langawa system provides a fine mechanism which enables the reuse of water. And ultimately, the water draining out of the Langawa over the uh, spills of the bottommost uh, tanks and through seepage uh, while serving the soil water ecosystem. Uh, and the very peculiar fact, peculiar fact is that uh, the system is uh, self-regulated. Self that means there are no gates or mechanism for controlling the water other than available at the water outlets through the dams of the village level tanks and uh, uh, small uh, river to paddy fields. In brief, it could be uh, stated that uh, the main water flow through the system was self-regulated with the help of spills and uh, uh, and manual control was done only at the vicinity of the crop fields. So with the help of the above said hydraulic structures, uh, the whole system was fed with the water gain from the very seasonal rain. The soil water ecosystem was focused on maintaining the water requirements of the entire system while mitigating flooding during the rainy season. Irrig irrigation was only a part of the ecosystem. So this is a uh, village level tank with its uh, features. And if we uh, talk about specifically about the Bisokotua, uh, with the introduction of the uh, uh, Bisokotua by our ancestors, it was able to regulate the water uh, discharge from Mahavava. Uh, these are some uh, dimensions uh, based on the archaeological evidence, anyway. Uh, then the, uh, there are some uh, misapprehension of the system, defining the Bisokutu as a well pit and considering Bisokutu is the place for fixing the gates uh, with the mindset of Weber as a storage tank and predetermine the existence of uh, gates for the tanks. Th these all are misapprehensions. And uh, in contrast, there is no evidence was found to force even a destroyed artifact, uh, damaged parts uh, of a such gate, and no sign was found over its smooth inner surface to trace any uh, mechanics, uh, any trace for any uh, uh, fixing a such gate. So function of Bisokutua, when we consider the function of Bisokutua, when the water in a large tank with high head enters the Bisokotua, the high velocity will be dispersed throughout the water regime uh, inside the Bisokotua, and the kinetic energy will be dissipated uh, without increasing the head inside the Bisokotua. Sorry. The water level uh, in the Bisokotua is lower than uh, that of the uh, Vava. And, uh, the high cross-sectional area of the outlet uh, will enable the release of high volumetric flow at lower velocity. In most of the ancient Bisokotua, the uh, pressure is very much equivalent to the atmospheric pressure. This is uh, evident uh, from the uh, wear-free top surface of the sluices. So, uh, this is a typical hydrograph for Bisokotua. Uh, it shows uh, inflow of water and the outflow of the water. So even without having a gate mechanism, this system can sustain, according to this uh, uh, hydrograph, because of uh, uh, the water uh, outflow is very low and very calm outflow during the uh, certain period of the uh, entire period of the year, 
And this is further elaborated uh, with the uh, data collected from uh, Murutuvela Weber. So inlet hydrograph obtained for a particular, uh, for this uh, Weber, for a particular time period was used uh, to infer the outlet hydrograph. Uh, assuming that uh, it had been fitted with an outlet Sorova with Bisogotuva, having typical dimensions of a preserved ancient Bisogotuva as uh, there is no such uh, uh, operating one, we will have to assume it and uh, fit it to the uh, available dimensions. So with that also you can see that this is inlet flow and this is outlet flow. So in uh, the phenomenon of Bisokuta is very natural. And, uh, so nature always tends to convert macro level kinetic energy uh, to the micro level kinetic energy. Whenever high kinetic energies are formed in water, it tends to become low by uh, dissipating this energy as heat. In natural flow, uh, you may see that uh, uh, when uh, velocity uh, creates, uh, velocity is high, then it creates erosion. Thereby large volumes and spaces are created. Then at these spaces, water uh, will get calmed, and that is energy dissipation. Uh, uh, the Bisokutua would have functioned under turbulence conditions as well, and uh, by convert, converting macrokinetic energy into microkinetic energy without increasing the pressure. For this action to take place, size of the Bisokutua is uh, very large than the well pit. It can't be well pit. So first water in Weber, uh, Will, con uh, will converge to the inlet of Bisogotu and energy will be reduced due to frictional effects. And uh, so I have already uh, mentioned these things. And uh, therefore our ancient in uh, engineers have used the very natural phenomena to protect the dams of high water head uh, Mahabhava when releasing water through them. If you can uh, please uh, play this video, you can see uh, one scenario. Teru uh, Weber, there, there is an existing uh, Bisoko tour, and, and uh, now it is at a functional level. And uh, that Bisoko tour uh, was fitted with a gate uh, very recent time. But uh, you can uh, see how this uh, flow uh, is very calm, and pressure is almost uh, uh, equivalent to the press, uh, uh, atmospheric pressure. So, Accordingly, I, I would like to conclude uh, my uh, first session. So with this interpretation of the function of Visokotuva, one can look at the whole ancient soil water ecosystem as a system which self-regulated uh, the storm water so as to uh, serve the ecosystem in an optimum way, in a sustainable manner. manner. Controlling would have been done only at the vicinity uh, of the crop fields. Feeding the crop fields is only a single function of the system. Uh, this is in contrast to mod contrast uh, to modern irrigation system, which are only meant to provide water to the uh, crop fields and controlling start at the very outlet of the uh, Mahabhava large tank with rather uncontrollable, uh, uncon uh, uncontrollable and complex uh, water regulatory mechanism resulting in the unsustainable systems which uh, are emerging today. So accordingly, the system almost self-regulated in compliance with the ecosystem and the process is cyclic and almost reversible. Accordingly, this is a sustainable system. Then I would like to move to the second part of my presentation. That is uh, self-adjustable. How uh, our structures are self-adjustable. So, Based on uh, engineering, uh, based on archaeological evidence, uh, I, I, we, uh, I present this uh, uh, analysis uh, of Dietavani uh, Stupa. So Dietavani Stupa, according to the Chula Vansa, it's uh, 400 feet high to the tip of its sphere and 317 feet across its uh, base. 
during the archaeological investigator investigations it has been found that the interior of the jetavani stupa is constituted of different materials arranged in different uh, orders this is not a merely uh, burnt uh, bricks structure so according to the findings of archaeological excavation uh, it was uh, developed a zonal segregation based on the based uh, on the constitution of such zones so time is limited i am not go one by one anyhow uh, this is the uh, base of this jetavan stupa the bricks used for construction of foundation of fully burnt full size bricks and where the uh, rock surface was not even it has been leveled by use in very hard clay layers a very thin clay mortar has been used as a bonding material between uh, these brick layers uh, which is called navanita matika in uh, mahavansa and uh, basal prince also uh, constructed same way uh, with the foundation and outermost part of the dome this is very uh, particular situation the outermost construction of the dome has been done by using full size bricks it is a larger it is the largest brick used uh, in the construction of jetavana uh, stupa and unusual fact here is the use of half burnt to unburnt bricks usage of these bricks had increased considerably from 21 meter there are uh, uh, here you can see that uh, uh, unburned bricks are used in between the burned bricks and butter like clay named as navanita matika has been used as a mortar when we uh, go more deeper the then the no, we meet uh, next zone to the outermost part of the dome uh, this part is constructed with half size bricks not uh, not full size bricks then uh, we meet another zone Uh, uh, which is consists which is consisted of uh, basically two uh, uh, two features, and one is wall segments, and the other thing is uh, between wall segments it is filled with uh, 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 burned bricks, uh, half burned uh, half burned bricks uh, 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 embedded in soil or two layers. These wall segments have been uh, positioned in several vertical planes, and orientation is not specified. and middle part of the dome is constructed with a uh, as as a soil column as a soil column and uh, it is constructed with the layers of small bricks beds embedded in the thick soil clay layer in an orderly manner so iskar chamber is uh, very heavy it is uh, its weight is almost 300 kilo newton 300000 kilo newton uh, so that weight is transferred uh, through uh, this uh, uh, middle zone uh, which has been constructed using small uh, brick beds embedded in soil in an orderly manner so uh, uh, these all are uh, archaeological uh, maps you can easily see that uh, uh, this is the foundation of uh, square chamber which is starts from uh, this uh, middle part this, this is the middle part uh, which consisted of is which, which consists of Uh, uh material uh, burn bricks embedded in the soil and the plaster is out outer surface is plastered with lime and sand, pl sand plaster and uh, this is a conjectured uh, cross section of the stoop uh, at the level of 70 feet above the uh, terrace uh, if you look at this uh, conjectured uh, conjectured uh, cross section uh, you can uh, see this outer uh, layer and as well as inner layers and these cross walls and uh, between these cross layers is filled with uh, another layers and also middle layer yeah okay sure and uh, force distribution inside the stupa structure uh, so therefore there will be a minimum lateral forces on the zone 2 and 3 otherwise uh, structure will get cracked so how uh, this uh, lateral force minimized uh, by using this uh, zonal segregation 
there are internal stresses and differential movement developed uh, due to expansion, thermal action, so water absorption. Also, if water is leaked into the middle part, frictional and cohesion, uh, cohesive components related to more column and basis of soil will become weak and unit weight will again increase and it will affect the radial uh, forces uh, on uh, and all these factors contributed to the increase of the radial forces on uh, zone 2 and zone 4. If these zones are not flexible to change its shape according to those forces, there will be severe bending moments uh, will be created locally. The behavior of uh, Navanita bond is of vital Im importance in this respect. Um, due to expansions of clay, uh, will almost be released if the zone two and three are expandable. Also, if zone two and three are not flexible, internal soil may become to passive stage uh, from active stage increasing the radial loads on zone two and three. Uh, so with this diagram, you can uh, uh, see how uh, these forces are acting on the uh, outer part of this structure. Uh, it is more elaborated uh, with this uh, diagram, and this is the radial force acting on the outer brick layer due to internal expansion, and there's a counter force as well uh, due to the frictional forces. And uh, because of this hoop uh, tensile forces and outer brick layers, uh, uh, hook tensile forces created. And uh, uh, there are some uh, uh, areas, we can call them soft pockets. This tube uh, should not be considered as a monolithic structure. And uh, due to this uh, action of soft pockets, could be for the elaborated using the concept of, concept of virtual work. So uh, according to this figure, uh, uh, now if some expansion or settlement or any other uh, thing is happen inside the soft pocket or in the rigid part near the soft pocket occurs, uh, some of uh, PIs will try to uh, display slightly. Due to this uh, slight displacement of some, uh, uh, due to some uh, PIs, then a strain will develop. Uh, uh, at the same time, the other uh, pressures may, be, may not get affected the stress will not propagate throughout the region. So conclusion of my uh, the second session, uh, uh, consideration of uh, functionality of Navanita clay bond and as well as application of, uh, of uh, Navanita bond in horizontal plane and application of unburned bricks to half burned bricks uh, in between creating soft pockets become very important only when the behavior of stopper structure is dynamically considered. In ancient stopper structure, stresses releasing mechanism are inbuilt. And hence, less stresses concentrations occurs. Consequently, the forces on the outer brick cover, all cover are uh, minimal, thus ensuring the longevity and sustainability. When considered the behavior of the structure in dynamic terms, the adaptation of stupa in line with local environment changes with the passage of time. The functionality of these uh, zones are, and now an Atika bonding could be clearly identified. The entire phenomena leads us to believe the design philosophy adopted by our uh, forefathers in uh, constructing mega structures had a different approach compared to the present one. So, new model governed by the rule of sufficiency. Our Sri Lankan engineers have a great responsibility as we are blessed with an engineer, engineering heritage nurtured with our Theravada Buddhism to heal the, this severe wound suffered by the entire ecosystem, including human beings. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Engineer Vijay Singh, for your presentation on uh, engineering heritage that we, can, we all can be proud of. So shall we have the next presentation, please?
Yes, we have one more presentation before we move on to the Q&A. And uh, also, we'll be recognizing all our resource persons with uh, mementos. And of course, we'll have the vote of thanks by Engineer Professor Manoj Palewata, President-elect IESL in the end. Right now, I have the pleasure of inviting our next presenter who graduated with a BSc Engineering, Mechanical Engineering from University of Moratua. He had his postgraduate diploma in Industrial Automation from the University of Moratua from 2008 to 2010 and Bachelor of Information Technology from the University of Colombo in 2006. He's a multi-talented personality. He's also a SEMA management level qualified personality. He is the director of Lanka Projects and Technologies Private Limited, an industrial technology supply and solution providing company. He's also the country representative of Nesh Technologies Germany, and uh, he has over 13 years of experience. He started work at State Engineering Corporation of Sri Lanka and has worked at EM Digital Private Limited, United Kingdom based research company, worked at Laser Zentrum Hangover, Germany. It's my pleasure in inviting engineer GSD Dahanayaka. Thank you very much for the introduction. Metals are widely used in engineering. Out of that, iron and steel are mostly used. 160 billion rupees worth of steel, iron and steel were imported during 2017 in the form of pro o articles. Exports were 6 billion worth of, 6 billion worth, means most were used locally. But 2000 years ago, our engineers made iron and steel and exported to the world. Today, we see irrigation canals, tanks, stupas, and rock carvings as the greatness of the history. But the little effort has been taken to discover ancient iron technology which used to build these great monuments. We had good metallurgy industry, such as copper, silver alloy, and alloys of nickel, zinc, or lead. During my presentation, I am planning to showcase the knowledge and skill set that our en ancient engineers had in iron industry. The technology was revolutionary in ancient development. Our ancestors had profound knowledge and skills, skills in iron and steel making. Ancient technology created a culture that lasted for 2,500 years in the history. My aim is to give a message. In national development, we need to focus on long-term industries, such as iron and steel, in the past. On behalf of Mechanical Engineering Sectional Committee, I thank Professor Niranjani Ratnayaka, President of IESL, and organizing committee for giving this opportunity to talk about rich iron industry of Sri Lanka. Mechanical Engineering Sectional Committee started to explore ancient iron smelting as a CSR activity. With the patronage of engineer Arjuna Manamperi and postgraduate Institute of Archaeology Research, we plan to revive ancient smelting technology by making demonstrating foundry. I would like to acknowledge archaeology researchers who work to discover this lost industry in Sri Lanka. Our talk is based on their findings. My special gratitude goes to Dr. Arjuna Tantilage and his staff for postgraduate Institute of Archaeology Research, University of Kalania. Archaeologists have found evidences of iron, and iron smelting since 10th century BC in Sri Lanka. They believe that from 4th century BC to 7th, 13th century AD, there was a large-scale commercial iron production. This was the great period of Andhradapura and Polonnaruwa. After the fall of Polonnaruwa, large-scale industry had disappeared, and village-scale iron production was prominent until the early 20th century AD. The production was merely used for the consumption.
If you look back to the Industrial Revolution in 17th and 18th century in Britain, commercial skill and production was prominent. Essential resources were coal, iron ore, copper, limestone, lead and water power. Prior to 2000 years, in uh, Industrial Revolution, ancient Sri Lankans had most of these resources or substitute in best form. They had produced iron and steel in commercial scale. Let me give a good example of high level of knowledge and iron and steel in 4th century BC. This is a metallographic diagram of a hypo-eutectoid steel chisel found in megalithic burial excavation. It was preserved inside a scenery urn in a stone cyst type grave. Charcoal inside the urn had a radiocarbonated 4th century BC. You can see the microstructure. It's a cross section. It's a uniform grain structure of hypoeutectoid steel. Perlite pers rays contains carbon up to 0.77%. Layers of perite and cement cementite are clearly visible. Perlite paste shows that the chisel was heated at least up to 726 degrees of Celsius and allowed for slow, slow cooling. Overall carbon percentage is 0.1 to 0.2 percent. This shows in early 400 BC, Sri Lankans had full-fledged iron industry in Sri Lanka. During the during the Anuradhapura and Polon Narva era, our construction and irrigation industries were at their peak. Our rulers had to face few South Indian invasions as well. It means most of the iron and steel must have been used in infrastructure development, tools, and weapon making. In the next couple of slides, I will show you the discovered artifacts of low carbon and medium carbon nails used in construction industry. This is a uh, steel nail found in 950 AD under the Pura Citadel. This was found in Andhradapura Citadel. It has a low carbon percentage of 0.022%. You can see the undeformed rounded ferrite grain structure. Rounded, rounded slag inclusion shows the signs of forging and reheating at least up to 400 degrees before slow cooling. This is a medium carbon steel nail of Andhradapura age. This also found in Andhradhapura Citadel in 950 AD. It has a carbon content less than 0.77%. In perlite phase, overall carbon content is 0 0.2 to 0.3%. It is evident that this nail is heated over eutectoid temperature of 723 degrees at least. Analysis of nail clearly shows different quality steers had been used in history. Ancient furnace technology shows melters knowledge and skills of iron making. Three main types of furnaces can be seen in the history. Commercial iron was produced in Bloomery furnaces in Anuradhapura. West facing monsoon wind operated furnaces in Balangoda. Later in history, village scale iron was produced in crucible furnaces. These pictures show a furnace yard in Sigiriya area. Large scale commercial iron was produced in process called bloomery before 13th century AD. Ruins of furnace yards and slag heaps can even be seen today. Iron ore and charcoal were stacked in a furnaces and air was blown through small clay pipes called tuyas by natural or forced draft. Excavations showed the pressure erosion marks of forced draft in back wall. Charcoal was burned in less oxygen to form carbon monoxide. Then the iron oxide reacted with carbon monoxide to separate the iron. The iron formed as a bloom covered with slag. Front wall of the furnace was broken to remove the bloom out. It's a waste facing monsoon wind operated furnaces. It's a unique technology so far discovered in Sri Lanka. 
the technology belongs to the same Anuradhapur era. But there is no evidence that those produced were used in Anuradhapura or Polon Narua. Therefore, some archaeologists believe these iron ore steel were exported. It was mentioned in Islamic history in the Middle East about the importing of serendip steel. But look, archaeologists do not have local evidences yet. Later replications of this furnace by the Professor Julif give insight about the technology. You can see the Professor Julif in the picture with Mr. Parakrama. Ancient technicians had a good understanding of Bernoulli theorem, aerodynamics, and thermal energy in practical manner. The furnace design was simplified to get an effect of 30 to 40 feet high stack by 18 inch wall to form induced draft furnace. Inside temperature was high enough to separate the iron from oxides. Influence of Indian invasions and political instability moved the kingdoms from the Polon Narva to south. Dry zone civilization started to move towards wet zone. Well-established commercial iron smelting industry also have downsized to village level industry after 13th century AD. Archaeologists have also discovered the iron ore depleted as well in, by this time. This map shows the iron ore excavated sites since 4th century BC to 13th century AD. All the sites were in the dry zone and intermediate zone. Dambulla Mahiangane area, Panirendava in Madampe, Samadava in Balangoda were the prominent ore locations. You can see the, the ore and the smelted iron were supplied to Anuradhapura Central, marked by the arrows. This map shows the transition to village scale iron ore production after 13th century AD to 19th century AD. All the sites were in wet zone and intermediate zone. Balangoda, Ratnapura, Akurasa, Ambalangoda, Sigiriya Mahiangane, or Panirendava were the prominent ore locations. Postgraduate Institute of Archaeology Research had explored 182 ore sites of dry zone and wet zone. With reasonable confidence, it can be mentioned hematite, ferric oxide, was used to as the primary iron ore for smelting in ancient Sri Lanka. All the smelting sites were near to hematite ore deposits. Hematite is the second secondary formation of ore rich with iron. Deposits can be found near to the earth's surface. It is estimated that five to six million tons of surface iron ore present in Sri Lanka. If we think of reviving the smelting technology, focus should be on magnetite or calm damgal. Ferrosoferic oxide is the primary form of the iron ore. There are magne ma magnetite deposits in Panirendava, Vilagedara, Buddha lands, Seruila. It is estimated there are about 5.6 million tons of magnetite in 30 to 120 meters deep in Panirendava alone. Ancient smelters had not used the magnetite as primary iron ore but they had used little with hematite. This picture shows a village level smelting furnace seen by Ananda Kumarasamy in 19th century. You can see the bellow blower behind the furnace world, furnace world. Charcoal heaps in the right side. There are two furnaces on the middle. Plan view and cross section of furnaces are shown in the left side. Charcoal and iron ore, broken into small pieces, were deposited in a crucible with some fluxes and fired. Until the temperature reached and fully smelted, air was blown by the bellow blower. The air flow rate is critical and it was included in the rhythm of folk song. You can hear some folk song.
I'm sure most of you have heard the word Kamburanava. Do you know the meaning? Iron ice melting is called Kamburanava, which is done by the Yamanno. Steel and equipment were produced by the Acharya or blacksmith. Acharya knew to control carbon percentage and make various grades of steel. They use several methods. One is forging process. Second method is crucible method to make steel. Picture shows can be a crucible furnaces. Food, wood steel or Damascus steel was said to be produced in this method. Some archaeologists guess even direct reduction to steel were possible in ancient period. You can see the picture of broken crucible in steel making. Next picture is a Damascus steel blade with unique carbon nanotubes you, is visible. Bottom is a plan view of a furnace arrangement with bellows. This picture shows plow blade of candy era. The technology was basic forge welding of different grain layer to a pattern. Thinking capability of archery was at high level. Five layers of large and small grain structure steel were used to produce the plow blade. Small grain forged steel was used as a hard outer layer. Large grain forged steel used in middle to get the overall bending capability of plow bay. Long term technology of iron and steel mastered by people lasted for more than 2500 years. Technology diminished in later 700 years and disappeared in early 20th century. Te technology diminution rate was rapid after the large scale steel imports by European invaders. Knowledge of metallurgy and foundry is limited in modern local industry. Our engineers have to rely on foreign experts very much. Just one comment question asked when discussing about reviving the iron smelting technology. Do we have sufficient ore deposits? The answer, we can manage even with existing deposits to produce value added products. The value addition can be done in preparing pure metal products, as mentioned by Professor Aldis, making differentiated alloys. We can produce to value added clients. Or smelting technology can be developed as a tourist attraction activity. Mild steel price may be around 120 to 150 rupees per kilogram. But once the value is added, 100 kilogram can be sold even over 100,000 rupees. This picture shows a homogenizer piston I bought few months back. It is a precisely machined special steel rod with some coating. When the price per kilogram is calculated, the cost was 185,000 rupees per kilogram. Finally, I believe the term good old day foundry should be replaced with the term advanced modern foundry concept. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dahanayaka, for the presentation on uh, ancient technology in uh, metallurgy. Brightening homes and lighting up cities across the lengths and breadths of our land. Building the foundations of a newer nation and reshaping our landscape for the better. Placing world-class tools and equipment in the hands of our people. Empowering a nation to move ahead with confidence and hope. Creating a new generation 
with new knowledge, the forerunners of our future. A prestigious partner for all your triumphant journeys through life. Redefining our people's quality of life with world-renowned brands that are the best at what they do. Serving you with standards that go above and beyond, bringing new meaning to professionalism and perfection. Helping create a healthier people and nation through cutting-edge medical technology. Applauding performance and celebrating victory under one flag as one nation. Growing the bounty of our earth, so that our nation reaps a bountiful harvest from every seed sown. Building on our heritage of turning water into life, by using every precious drop for the enrichment of our land, of our economy. Providing a foundation of service and security as our skyline reaches for the stars. Taking the high road that leads to trust. Letting you travel through life with assurance. Helping to power the nation towards economic prosperity. Serving our land and its needs, even beyond our shores. Moving rail transportation to the next level. Raising the flag of excellence through an extensive family of professionals. Bringing in the best of the world for the betterment of our country. Gathering laurels and accolades in everything we do with honor at our core. A distinctive vision that helped re-engineer the future of a promising nation and still continues to do so. Keeping our flag flying high by providing world-class technological solutions to the nation. Demo, the incomparable Sri Lankan. So may I call upon the three speakers to the stage to have the panel discussion? Yes, our three resource persons, can we have you to take your seats on stage? Okay, thank you very much uh, for the uh, very informative presentations. Uh, we, since we are already behind the schedule, uh, we will have a, a panel discussion for about 50 minutes, but uh, if there are questions, we'll see whether what we can do. Uh, first of all, uh, 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 let me uh, uh, 
as one question from uh, Professor uh, Alvis. Now, you said that uh, nanotechnology has been started, I mean, uh, researching on that recently. Uh, what kind of uh, uh, government, uh, uh, how do you call it, uh, uh, backing is there for this to be uh, further, bring it to uh, the commercial level or uh, production plant level? Uh, remember I mentioned that Government did support. I mean, without the government support, it would not have been realized in 2008. Research yeah, Research Institute. Yeah. Even right now, um, now there have been significant in the last three, four years, there have been significant input to strengthen the analytical capabilities. So there has been huge investment. We no longer have a 50 50 partnership. Actually, government probably has an 80% uh, okay. ownership now because so much of money has been put in by the government. Uh, but the PPP is going on, so government has supported. But we have this lack of uh, lack of converting what we are doing to the the commercial, uh, the economy side. Okay. That is lacking. I am not sure it is only with uh, only with nanotechnology, but with the rest of the stuff as well. We because we think this okay, this has this area has to be once a champion is there, the the re, that area is funded. It's like we give university research, but we never look at how to get the university research out into the market. Uh, so I, I suppose it's not unique to the uh, nanotechnology, but it yeah. is a problem that we face. Yeah. So that's one of the things that we said about the second motor of ours is like research into rupees. Yeah. That needs yeah. to be emphasized. Very correct, yes. Uh, if I come back to, uh, I mean, uh, engineer Vijay Singh, uh, this uh, heritage, we were talking about this, uh, I don't know whether I'm too cri much critical now, the Soko 2 and all these structures. Do you think that those are, uh, uh, I mean, for the present kind of uh, resources we are having, dams or high, high uh, dams, uh, can we have this kind of structure still uh, uh, used in our uh, systems? I don't know whether you got the point. Yeah, uh, for the dams, uh, the thing is, uh, we'll have to address uh, for a large volume of water to release, to get release of them uh, without damaging to the uh, dam. That's what we did uh, uh, in our large tanks, but the volume, uh, when, in co when we compare into the present uh, situation, may be lesser than that. But the, uh, but the principle, uh, we take that principle and try to apply to the system. Uh, we can do some uh, trial, I think, because of uh, this proof system. And the principle is also very uh, well we define. Then uh, I think that uh, it could be. OK, thank you. Maybe we can uh, discuss it further later. Uh, Dr. Dahanayake, now this uh, iron, you said the early 20th century, our technologies uh, got uh, sort of disappeared. Like, uh, What is the reason for that? I mean, why, why didn't it continue? Because uh, foreign uh, yeah. supplies are cheaper or they were more? Actually, the, about the iron technology, is a little known area in the history. Mm. Do, uh, we had a peak the uh, technology actually, the very mature technology during the Anuradhapura and Polon Narva era, which was a, a commercial level industry. After that, it was uh, a feudal system and the technology was diminishing. Uh, during that period, uh, during the early Anuradhapura and Polon Narva era, uh, I think uh, Sri Lanka was at the middle of the world. It's, it's one of the most developed nations in the world. So in that sense, we can see that, that uh, all the uh, culture, technology, and overall atmosphere uh, was a commercial level industry. Then the demand was there because we know that our, uh, we had iron and we had steel, not as normal steel, the similar to today's steel. And even uh, uh, it's, it is said that we had Damascus steel also, but it's not, uh, seen in uh, our evidences, but in Islamic evidences, it was there. 
if you con consider that level of uh, industry, it means it's a fabulous industry. Mainly the commercial activities, I think. Well, thank you very much. I'm sure that our uh, audience has many questions to ask. Uh, we are ready to take up questions now. Well, nanotechnology is one of the areas uh, which we can think of uh, for our future, isn't it? Uh, yeah, please. Uh, just to add something to uh, what uh, uh, also said about uh, graphite. Uh, he said 100 years. In fact, it's 200 years. First shipment uh, from Sri Lanka uh, has gone to uh, uh, Faber Castell in United States in 1824. It's recorded, 1824. So uh, what has happened is it has been in the hands of the private sector in the early 1970s. And 70s, it became a public under the public sector with nationalization of the uh, the graphite uh, industry, uh, especially Mogul mines. But uh, the private sector wasn't interested in value addition because uh, it was so profitable selling the graphite. In fact, uh, owners of the uh, Mogul mines were the richest people in this country at that time. Uh, so, so they didn't want to any further. They were not greedy, greedy to add any more value addition. They were just exporting it. But unfortunately, the 20 years under the public sector, uh, nothing much, much happened. In fact, uh, 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 Professor Pallavatta's father uh, was also involved in this industry, and I was also had some uh, hand in this one. And we tried our level best to in, in, uh, the, in, in the, get the government interested in putting some funds to do value addition. Uh, uh, there was, uh, the Treasury was not interested at all because it is bringing enough foreign exchange, so they were happy with that. Uh, they were complacent with that, I would say. And also, the, the, uh, those days were the days where the, uh, the World Bank and uh, Asian Development Bank were funding uh, lot of industries in this country. Uh, they were not at all interested in value addition uh, because uh, they, you, are, you can understand, they were, they were happy that the value addition happens elsewhere, not in this country, this part of the world. So that's how, that's the this thing. And then 1990, it became completely privatized. And now it's under Croft Bull, uh, under German management. But still, we have the Kahataga mines and Kuranga mines under us still. Uh, so uh, if we want to, uh, he was talking about this, uh, the world's best graphite. That's true. Because if you take any uh, textbook in the early days in graphite, they start with Ceylon graphite. Uh, that's that sort of thing. And we had 99% pure graphite, whereas the rest of the world has 5% graphite. You know, it's mixed with clay at 99% is uh, out of this world, you know? That kind of graphite uh, you'd never find. And of course, there are very deep mines, uh, 2,000, 3,000 feet deep, uh, those mines. Uh, so, but still, uh, we, can, we can still do it. Uh, let the Mogala be handled by the Germans, but the rest of the places, we still have a lot of graphite and uh, our own uh, uh, within, within our country. So uh, we could still do it. Uh, as you, you all must sort of push uh, and uh, get the government interested in and, uh, at least graphene uh, technology can be done. Thank you. Thank you so much. Just a quick comment on it. Yes, definitely. But it's uh, now, now you, there is definitely now a company with LOLC and Slintech coming. 
but this is a time for decision making it's sometimes like kahatagaha joining hands because now kahatagaha as a state owned enterprise is not doing very well i mean in terms of profitability but now this is an opportunity if you take a decision you become part of that uh, kahatagaha's graphite is better than bogala and i think ragedara has even more. but of course i remember university of peradeniya researchers telling because there's some activity at quite a good lot of activities at both peradeniya and ifs in ifs and the i heard from them that a toyota head of research who came to sri lanka and they said maybe scientifically it's 99.6 but his sons had been my god you have 100% i mean forget about 99 point your us one is like absolutely pure so that has been toyota head of research come in so um, but if kahatagaha takes as an soe uh, this is what the decision making lacks you see an opportunity but you don't partner that and transform an economy uh, that awaits people who are you 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 said that kataka is good very good by thing but only pe- only thing is uh, the people who are opposed to our developing says uh, uh, some disadvantage about kataka it is uh, it has uh, some uh, uh, iron in it and that iron has to be got rid of uh, otherwise uh, uh, that will create some problem but these graphites now in we have more or less characterized lintech has done a lot of work and u university of uva well uh, some researchers so now the point is the ability to characterize is there one of the biggest things that happened with lintech was the coming in of the superior analytical infrastructure for nano specifically and you can go down to the details and now you can argue with anybody who is buying or telling us from outside no we know what is there so that's something that we now have turn tables on acharya ajit mahatma ge mam prashna ahanne den nano technology ge tiyena billi mogu tiyena apita graphite us hunda illu api dana ga mahatma ge kena issara kaale indama yakata haduwalu දැන් මේ බැරි ඇයි මේ විශ්වවිද්‍යාල වල ඉන්න අපේ ඉංජිනේරුවන්ට මහාචාර්යවරුන්ට පරීක්ෂණ කර කර ඉන්න වෙලාවේදී මේක කමර්ෂලයිස් කරගන්න බැරි ඇයි අපිට අපිට බැරිද වීදි සටන් වලට යන්න මේක කරන්න කියලා දැන් නිකන් වීදි සටන් කරන වෙනුවට මේවට වීදි සටන් වලට වහන්න බැරිද අපිට මම මම සීරියස්ලි අහන්නේ මොකද්ද බෙන්න ඕනේ ඇයි අපිට මේ වෙන් සල්ලි හොයන්න බැරි ආර්ථිකය ගොඩ නගන්න බැරි සල්ලි හොයාගන්න බැරි කමක් නැහැ මොකද මම එතනදිත් කිව්වේ අර ලංකාවේ ආ ඩිසිෂන් මේකිං එකේදී මොකද මැලේසියාවල නැනෝ මැලේසියා කියන ප්‍රෝග්‍රෑම් එක රෝඩ් මැප් එකක් හැටියට ගත්තම නැනෝ මැලේසියා එක මැලේෂියන් ගවර්න්මන්ට් එක දැන් 1% GNI gross national income එක බලාපොරොත්තු වෙනවා නැනෝ ටෙක්නොලොජි වලින් ඒ කියන්නේ ගවර්න්මන්ට් එක මෙච්චර දානවා නම් ROI එක ස්පෙසිෆිකලි කියලා ප්‍රොජෙක්ට්ස් වල ප්‍රොජෙක්ට්ස් වල ඉවැලුවේට් කරනවා කොච්චර ඉකොනොමි එකට බෙනිෆිට් එකක් දෙනවාද කියලා ඒ කියන්නේ පුෂ් කරනවා කොමර්ෂලයිසේෂන් පැත්තට යන්න ඉකොනොමියට ගන්න ඒ ඒ ඒ පාත් එක තමයි මම කිය පොඩ්ඩක් මිසින් කියලා හදලා යන්නේ හදල මොනාරි නිෂ්පාදනය කරන එක අපේ පොඩ්ඩක් මිසින් නැත්තම් ඕක විතරක් නෙවෙයි ඉතින් අර යූරියා 25ක් අඩු කරන එක පිදුරු වලින් සිලිකා අරන් නැනෝ සිලිකා පේන්ට් හදනවා ඒ අතින් ගොඩක් ඒවා එතකොට ක්වාට්ස් සෝලර් සෙල්ස් සෝලර් සෙල්ස් වලට ඕනේ නැහැ සෙමි කන්ඩක්ටර් පියුරිටි ඊවන් දැට් ඒ වයිනෙත් අපේ අපේ ක්වාට්ස් එක මොකද එකක් 99.1 එකක් පියෝ ඉතින් aka have a thought a isl can play a role in saying look we need to do this and then the engineers have to do that anan kiyanne paarata bahala api try karamu kiyala salli denne kiyala mewa karanna na wade thiyenne mehema hamoma paarata wahina wagena eka eka it's not discipline thing i think you have to have a different approach in that paarata wahina eka is not a is not a discipline act anyway man danna monari karanna kiyala me wade karanna nattan katha karanna githara api karanna ekai i won't comment on that <laughs> දෙමුතු ලක්මාල් මම හිතනවා දැන් අපි සාකච්ඡාව අද දවසෙම තිබ්බ වේවා බලපුවාම අපි හිතනවා දැන් අර හැමෝම කතා වෙනවා වගේ අද ඉකොනොමියකේ හැම එකේම චේන්ජ් එඩියුකේෂන් එකේ චේන්ජ් එකක් ගැන කතා කරද්දී දැන් ඒ වගේ චේන්ජ් වෙන්න ඕන තැනකට ඇවිල්ලා ඒ නිසා මම හිතනවා දැන් අර ඉකොනොමියක ගැන කතා කරද්දී දැන් අපි පාරට වහින වගේ ඒ වගේ එනවා වගේ දැන් අපිට හැම අවුරුද්දෙම මම හිතන්නේ බජට් ප්‍රොපෝසල්ස් අපින් ඉල්ලනවා ISL එකනුත් ඉල්ලනවා ඒ නිසා මම හිතනවා මේ සාකච්ඡාවෙම ඉදිරි පියවර විදිහට අපි මේකේ දින ටික එකතු කරලා හරි අපේ පයිප්ලයින් එකක් විදිහට හරි එහෙම නැත්නම් ප්‍රොපෝසල් එකක් විදිහට හරි එහෙම නැත්නම් මොකක් හරි අප්‍රෝච් එකක් විදිහට ගවර්මන්ට් එකට අපි මේ ටික මෙතන විශේෂයෙන් මේ ප්‍රසන්ටේෂන් පහෙන් හා එම හැම එකේම විවිධ 
areas gana alut proposals gana sandhaan guna ini sa ATK ekatu kalla mih conference ke idri peer vidhi hata dedas dahana mih budget ke kebenuin proposal newe guideline guidelines vidhi hata api ISL ke vidhi hata mih tawa mih ke idhi tawa session neka korna mih presenters lahari tawa inna api engineers ekatu kalla idri hata mih ke final target ke idri hata api adha fix kerga tu thundai ke lehi tenawa government ke hata budget guideline nikat dengan dah dah sedahana meter. Thank you. Ini hampir masa mereka news site am mereka dahana pulau guna terus constantly mindset mereka dahana pulau angin. Ayam mana tu? Aurud tak kira tu? Ikan. Hampir dah mereka tahu ini hampir dah mereka media hara hari mereka dah pe media is very poor. Eh ini dah constantly kerat persistence pays off. Persistence reduces resistance. At one point, that may, the tipping point may happen. May not today, may not tomorrow, but. Mahachar, what is the question? 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 Engineer sama juga kibu lagi. Apa itu awasnya? Nah, bidya itu dengan mata awasnya. Nah, bayi, ekamar, biasa aja kan dengan mata ini katanya taragan yang lalat sama api kata keran dulu. Ia ni kata anda re, jangan tak berat teruk teruk terkena bidya terkian dulu. Teruk sama jangan hendak kelengen ni. Ia bagi apa itu palne kerana desa palat ni orang memikat hukuman dengan kodu betul macam yang bagi apa ni rantai memikat mata keran dulu. No, mata kiri memang dulu. No, commercialise kerana pentat ekamai bidya awasah dek memikat tu kerana kita mati ini. Apa berat sahaja nanti no betul macam nanti kat enda pulau. हमें हमें सुनिश्चित हम पैक तीन ऑफ़ योर डिस्टेंस। ओके थैंक यू। एनी अदर क्वेश्चंस? या। फेसबुक के पौड़ी वचन या तीन ऑफ़ लंका और पीरियुन निशा उगता रटकिया नोवे Kuha ka ugata ratakiya nisaama lanka wa piri huni. Eta kota, me api engineer o mecharakal behave unu engineer o ko. Inne Australia wadhi nava sila anthe da. Api ta ekata vada piri la tiyena wadhi. Api ta ISL ka patteng mokadda karanda pulluwa. Api mole tiyena minisu yanwa pita rata. Eta kota lanka wa venu yeng vada karanda kaud. Mood minisu da. Iting ekata monohari ISL ka patteng ekatu e la monohari karanda pulluwa anthe government level lege policy level lege. एक आय मागे प्रश्न। Well, what you said is true, but I don't know. Are you still? Anybody who wants to respond to that? Mai tahun ini hari Pride in Sri Lanka Engineering kira ni kan, hati kerana puluang, awasnya tak. Betul, awak cakap ni ada tu nak kata, kata tu kerana puluang ni kan? Eh, tetapi semua cakrawala kerana kita tahu kata kerana ni. Apa itu? Ina beri tanak kriya, ada ni hinda, loko mana kohi hari, apa itu danuma, mana tentang apa hakia, provision, kata hari daya kat kalla, ini kan, mak hari hambu kerana puluang dia kata macam engineer kerana ni. Mereka itu, aku juga kalah hati semai, macam dia. आईएस एल के विदेश हरे ऐसे में अत्यंत अपने नॉलेज ग्रुप पे आपके विदेश हरे नॉलेज वर्क करेंगे नॉलेज डेमेन ने आपके विदेश हरे इतना भी यहाँ पे सिस्टावर है कि इन्हें वाला आपे मेरे को राठे आपे इंजीनियर वन वन आपे माखरी पदनमक निरूपण एक करने के लिए आप जा कराने पड़ेगा आपे हम क Benua yang aku katakan ni, tapi kerana nak pulang, kita mahu hidup. Engineeru, api engineeru, widi hatta api kiapu samahar karena, ini government teh hatta, yang mana tentang rajaan nolat kiapu karena, ikhaya kerajaan patuna ada pasi eva benar sena. Ini ikh me rajaya hatta yang kisi jowjana awal ya kitri pat kerut. 
ඒක සමහරලා ටික දුරක් ගිහිල්ලා ඊළඟ රජයෙන් ඒක එක්කෝ කෙරෙන්නේ නැහැ. ඉතින් මේක මේ national policy එකක් එහෙම නැත්නම් මොකක් හරි ජාතික වශයෙන් වෙන ප්‍රතිපත්තියක් හරහා ගේන්න ගේන්නෙත් නැහැ ඒක ගෙනල්ලා තිබුණාට එක්කෝ එක එක යම් යම් තැන් වලදී ඒක එක එක පැති වලට යනවා. ඉතින් ඒක ඒක ගේන්න නැතුව අපිට මේ ඔබතුමාලා කියපු ක්‍රමවේදයට එහෙම නැත්නම් මේ රට ඉස්සරහට අරන් යන්න පුළුවන්ද ඒ ඒ එක මොකක් හරි රෝඩ් මැප් එකක ගෙනියන්නේ නැතුව මේ රට එහෙම ගෙනියන්න පුළුවන්ද අපි දැකලා තියෙන ගොඩක් වෙලාවට කියන ඒවා අහන්න නැහැනේ වෘත්ති කියෝ කියන ඒවා අහන්න නැති තත්වයක් තියෙන ඒකට ඒ ඒක ඒක කොහොමද ජය ගන්නේ ेशन रेलवेटिवर एक करला एक गवर्नमेंट टेकट करला एक गवर्नमेंट टेकिंग नो कल इला गवर्नमेंट टेकट ये तो कुटा समाहरण वाला वाटा जाएँ अब बेहमत तक अतिर वाली ओके एडवांटेजेस देखा तिरा अपे अब दाम आंडू एक कपट टेकिंग अनिपत्र मारू इनो वाली द मेग गवर्नमेंट टेकिंग एक 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 होना नहीं है क्या लकी वाला अनित गवर्नमेंट एक करण डाल रहा हूँ इतने इतने कुटा समाहरण वाला वाटा साइकल के देपार ग्याह में समाहरण वाटा पे किवू का बैठा करता हूँ इतने ये वाकी वो कहे बताव कि क्या इंडोर है इका पारक केले हवन नहीं केले निकाय इधर बै है बताव कि क्या इंडोर है देख देंगे आरे इलेक्ट्रिफिकेशन और रेलवे के लिए का अभी कोई तरह काल एक्टिस की हुआ है केला देख देंगे कुलो हनु देंगे एक ना होता रहता है क्या देंगे एक आंधुए दे एक वाके कता कर दे बल प्रेजेशन <laughs> so clearly that's continuously it was observed now everybody is coming to the point ultimately the government is responsible and uh, the government uh, uh, want to support for everything for engineers so uh, in the morning uh, a target also was set by uh, presenter stating that uh, the people should not come on to you and uh, you have to work everything to the it iot and things like that so why can't we think uh, or at least to set out uh, uh, target for engineers uh, because engineers are involving not only in engineering field uh, even accountancy and uh, attorney at law and uh, different field so why can't we think about getting into the politics and at least uh, five people if uh, we are they are in the parliament uh, can't we change or do something so why we are not thinking about that at least people who are here for the next 5 years if we are making a target to enter into politics and being in that and uh, i don't know just uh, it's a proposal i'm thinking in that way also because now ultimately we are talking about the politicians and the government but still it is not happening please for your attention okay thank you very much for your coming any other comments or questions yeah actually we are we are deviating very much from the yeah. theme of the afternoon session mm -hmm. i want to put it to the correct track now okay uh, the one of the presenters told that uh, there was evidence that a lot of iron produced were exported but uh, the, uh, the the he concluded that because it is not found elsewhere here so it was a pure guesswork it would have been exported actually such kind of uh, sweeping statement i don't know okay we can be proud of our heritage but uh, 
what is the real evidence available to use to say that uh, uh, these things could have been exported? That is one question. And uh, as for the second one, actually, okay, we are talking about a lot of bombastic statements, but uh, this morning, Dr. C. M. Laputia told a very pertinent question. There are two kind of diametrically opposite, uh, opposite, diametrically opposite views. One says in the mana base in who, uh, gas is available, one says it's not at all available. So these kind of things are the one we have to give priority. Not about unwanted things because those things are not going to contribute to our economic development. We can be proud of our past heritage, it's okay. But uh, we have to, uh, we have to alive and alert to the real, realistic, pragmatic point we have to approach. Something has to be marketable and it has to contribute positively to the economy. Sometimes the fast technology may be uh, okay, it, it, it may have worked very well at that time, but will it be possible in a in a competitive environment like this? So sweeping statement and bombastic statement will not, uh, we can uh, go to the political state and talk like this, but as, as far as practicing and professional engineers, if we want it, it should be technically feasible and financially viable, and it should be socially acceptable. Our forefathers have done something, it's good, we can be proud of, but it should be, we have to compete with the existing, uh, competing world environment. Okay, thank you. Uh, Dr. Dhanak. Yeah. Uh, first question. Uh, the, the Balangoda area, iron production. That, uh, the, uh, the West Bay phase in uh, monsoon wind operated furnaces, the iron was produced. That iron was produced during the period of uh, Anuradhapur and Polonnaruva area. But the Balangoda produced were not, there was actually, there, there are no evidences that Balangoda produced were not used in Anuradhapur or Polonnaruva area. That is why some archaeologists believe those produced could have been exported. Because there are, uh, during that same period, uh, in Islamic history and the, uh, mostly the Middle East, they have evidences. In their history, it is mentioned that iron was imported from Sri Lanka. It's called Serendip iron. But in the uh, Anuradhapura area, the mainly the, the, for the city supplies was uh, taken by the Panirenda and Sigiri area iron ores. And the Seruila, there's a, there's a uh, iron, uh, copper pirates, uh, deposit uh, that produced the uh, copper in Seruil area. At, and also there were some uh, iron ore deposits in Seruil area as well, scattered iron ore deposits. Those were used in uh, Anuradhapur and Polonnaruva uh, kingdoms. So those were they used locally and some were might have uh, exported, but the uh, Balangoda production was uh, actually, uh, they believe it was exported. just want to uh, make some comments on that as well that's uh, in my presentation uh, that's why I try to uh, tell you that uh, uh, we are we are we are go behind uh, some needs we want to uh, anyhow satisfy these needs so uh, and at the same time we can't operate uh, within the system that's the thing if it is a feasible, then it is okay. If it is not, not feasible, we will have to look at the, uh, some other uh, model. Otherwise, no need. And yes, that's okay. That's why I, I raised this question. Is it feasible? So, uh, on the other hand, uh, without uh, all these things are uh, uh, supported by our mindset, if we are ready to uh, change our mindset, then uh, we can operate in uh, different, different uh, scenario. So uh, as engineers, we must uh, think about these things. We are every day talking about the pollutions and sustainability. Why, why we, we are talking about sustainability then? No need to talk about. If the system is sustainable, no need to talk about the sustainable system, no. The, the, uh, my question is whether we can operate sustainability, the system. That's uh, what I try to explain you. So within uh, this closed system, 
our activities are more and more, then uh, we are going to irreversible situation and uh, disorder situation is more and more. Then uh, we will have to face this situation. There is uh, no other solution. Our people in our countrymen could not use that te technology. What is the need to sell our uh, silver spoon to the others? They, that is where the politicians should step in and say, look here, it is our Sri Lankan product. We should first, first of all, we ourselves should utilize it. No, what is the, who made the decision to sell it? Only those four inventors who has invented that patent product or? I, no, I this, is a, this is a major, major error that we have in our mindset when it comes to intellectual property. Intellectual property is sometimes you don't need to produce things in your own place, but you can recover money continuously by giving rights in a controlled manner to the outside. When the Sri Lankan patent, uh, uh, that, ex that exchange was done with the Nagarjuna, India, uh, the Sri Lankan right to use that particular fertilizer in Sri Lanka was never given to the India. No, it, uh, the use, uh, sales for the Sri Lankan company in Thailand was not given to India. Uh, so it was uh, kept in Sri Lanka. But the primary reason that it, it wakened up the Sri Lankan mindset quite a lot, specifically the political establishment also, uh, that, uh, and, and then the private sector, that something like this is possible because four scientists doing something, spending some money on the patent, and there is this great interest from outside and they are even prepared to pay 3.1 million rupees, uh, which how many tourists have to come through Katnaga to get that? and how much of advertisement you have to do that to get that, right? So, um, so that was a kind of an eye-opener. So there was a two, two reasons for that decision. It is one is opening up the eyes when there was no real support to the research side. This was a completely different way. We would never handle real intellectual property. So uh, Sri Lanka didn't lose. Sri Lanka didn't really lose at that. There's so much of gain. But Indians had a urea manufacturing facility which Sri Lanka never had. And I mean, at that stage. So even if we did, it's like what is happening with the titanium. We still cannot produce it because we need still need the big factory. Big factory needs again investment. That is not happening, right? So here there was a quick transaction without losing much of your rights and demonstrating uh, the potential. And so many others have now, as a result, taken on to research and development. And the IP pathway of now there's a b biggest blue chip is working on research, thinking only on IP and IP sales. So you use your gray cells, get something new, protect it across, and you give certain rights. United States budget, 33% of the GDP comes from intangible assets. Korea, every quarterly bulletin of the Korean bank discusses the intangible assets. Central bank report in Sri Lanka never discusses intangible assets. Budget never discusses intangible assets, yet we are talking about in a knowledge economy. So we need to understand this. We cannot work in the commodity mindset. So all of us need to change on this IP pint up, but I'm not saying IP is the way, way forward, but we need to understand realities with IP. Okay. I am Arthanayaka from Andhradhapura. Uh, I want to know about that uh, Navadith, Mati and uh, that uh, Stupas uh, bottom there. Uh, as I know, there's a, uh, there's a more stress at the bottom that called hoop stress. So, to control that hoop stress, that Navanita Mati and that uh, joint is used for that era. Uh, is the, can, can you explain that? So, yes. Mr. Jessica, uh, leave it to your answer to one minute, please. Yeah. Now, hoop, is, uh, hoop stresses is created uh, at the outer part of the dome. So, yeah, so it is created because of this uh, 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 load, vertical load. And uh, because of this vertical load, the uh, radial forces are created. That radial forces are acted on the outer surface. So, uh, if if we if we uh, if that outer surface can adjust to a certain extent, then uh, uh, that stress can be released. For that, this uh, uh, clay bond is helpful. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, let me close this session or the panel discussion with that uh, and I uh, uh, want to thank uh, all the three presenters or rather uh, resource persons uh, for their great contribution towards the uh, success of this session. Thank you.
Well, we, earned, we ended on a lovely note, fantastic response from the audience. So it proved to be a very productive and meaningful uh, National uh, Engineering Conference 2018. Let's recognize our chair of this session and the eminent resource persons. I'd like to invite uh, the president of IESL, Professor Rathnayaka, to present tokens of appreciation to the chair and uh, Professor Nandalal, can we have you to step forward? And the uh, presenters, please. Everybody, put your hands together. Give them a round of applause. Ended on a wonderful note. We had fantastic response. A lot of questions. Professor Ajit Thialvis, thank you very much for your very effective uh, presentation. Thank you, Engineer Sanjeeva Vijay Singer. Thank you very much. And uh, also, Engineer GSD Dahanayakar. Thank you very much. We've almost come to the end of uh, this very important conference. Uh, we have uh, the formal personality to propose the vote of thanks, Engineer Professor Manoj Palevata, President of IESL, his President-elect IESL, the President-elect IESL, Engineer Professor Manoj Palevata, to propose the vote of thanks. All yours, Professor. Everybody, a round of applause, after which we invite all of you for refreshments. Hi, Bowen. Uh, good evening to you. I see that now we have gone through a very hectic day and uh, it's very tired, so I will try to keep this to the minimum. Uh, though he's not here, I address the Honorable Minister, uh, our chief guest, uh, uh, Mr. Kabi ha Hashim, and Engineer Professor Sriranjani Ratnayaka, our President, past Presidents, Vice Presidents, Council members, my fellow members of IESL, conference speakers and moderators, special invitees, and ladies and gentlemen. I have the honor of delivering the vote of thanks to bring this National Engineering Conference 2018 to a successful close. Organized by the Institution of Engineers Sri Lanka, this is the fifth conference since the inaugural conference held in October 2013 held under the name Sri Lankan Engineering for National Development yesterday, today, and tomorrow. This conference brought together, as it did uh, at its earlier events, expert speakers in the sphere of varied engineering disciplines suited for the selected team. They shared their experience, knowledge, and experience to make all of us have an open mind with regard to uh, lessons that could be learned regardless of from whichever era. First of all, I would like to thank our chief guest, Honorable Minister of Highways and Road Development, Mr. Kabir Hashim, for gracing this event, uh, who has, under his purview, a ministry so closely associated with engineers and we wish to thank him uh, for the motivation and courage he inspired by his speech. Secondly, I would like to thank the eminent panel of speakers of the conference uh, for having shared with us their expertise, knowledge, and experience, and their words of wisdom towards advancing the conference theme, Sri Lankan Engineering for National Development, yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Professor Arumugam Nalanthan, Professor of Wireless Communications and Head of the Communication Systems Research Group, University of London. 
Sir, we thank you for accepting our invitation and coming all the way from UK to be with us and contributing to the success of this conference. Your presentation on a technology that helped the world leapfrog to what it is today and promises much more to come in the future was wholly informative to the, uh, for the audience. It was a fitting contribution to the theme of the conference. Then engineer Dr. Manoda Gamage, founder, managing director, intelligent solutions and consultancy, private limited. Sir, we thank you for being with us today and your presentation of where the future lies in technologies, pushing the boundaries of all aspects of life towards smarter living. It, value, it added value to this conference and towards advancing the theme. Then uh, engineer Dr. Tilak Sebala Pitiya, energy consultant and editor of uh, Slima Journal. You have always been with us uh, in our moments of need, uh, such as uh, for this conference. We thank you for accepting our invitation and being with us today, contributing to the success of the conference. In the important area of uh, energy, your views and your points made, I think, added quite a big value to the theme of the conference. Dr. Ajit Bialwis, Professor of Chemical Engineering, University of Moratua, uh, Project Director, Coordinating Secretariat of, for Science, Technology and Innovation. We appreciate you uh, being with us today and insights you provided in your presentation. Your emphasis on reversing the lagging in commercialization of research findings touches a much needed to and talked about aspect of our development strategy and to which leading engineering organizations in the country are now lending their support to OCAM, I hope. Engineer Sanjeev Vijay Singh, Deputy General Manager of Civil Works, Central Engineering Consultancy Bureau. Uh, the views expressed by you about the ancient structures and our heritage and what could be learned from that for the future is very informative and useful. I think our, especially our civil engineers will take note of this, uh, these aspects. Then engineer GST Dahanayak, director of Lanka Projects Technologies Private Limited, your keen interest and exposure to the country's ancient technologies together with the views exposed, expressed by you about the steel making process has contributed much to the theme. So, and we thank you for it. I also would like to thank engineer professor Rohan Munasinghe, head of the Department of Electronics and Telecommunication Engineering University of Moratua, and engineer professor KDW Nandalal, senior professor and former head of the Department of Civil Engineering Institute of Peradeniya for successfully moderating uh, the panel, panel discussions and coming out with the uh, member views or the audience views to be intermingled with the views of the panels. I thank the National Engineering Conference organizing team, our own uh, ISL team, for their hard work to ensure the success of this conference. My special thank goes to engineer Neil Abhisekara, CEO, Executive Secretary, engineer Anura Panditharatna, Deputy Executive Secretary, and the all hardworking staff of the ISL Secretariat who were behind the lots of hard work that went into making this conference a success. Thank you. Also, I thank uh, the sponsors of this conference. Main sponsor, National Science Foundation of Sri Lanka, Gold, co-sponsor, INSI Cement Limited, Gold co-sponsor, Diesel and Motor Engineering PLC, Silver sponsor, Dialogue Asiata Group, Banking partner, HSBC, Printed Media sponsor, Vision Newspapers Limited, Electronic Media sponsor, Independent Television Network. Further, I would like to thank our veteran compere, Mr. Faisal Bonso, for conducting the event in a fitting manner, and the management and the staff of Kshatriya Vila for their cooperation in organizing the matter, the conference very successfully. Thank you very much, all of you, and please pardon me if I have 
inadvertently missed any person or organization who, was, who has contributed to the success of this event during my vote of thanks. Before concluding, this is the first time we held the conference outside the, the Colombo area. And I must uh, thank very deeply the, our YMBA chapter for, for contributing in, uh, in organizing this, this event and having a huge gathering to participate in this event. So I would like to thank the chairman and the executive committee of the Viamba, Viamba chapter of ISL for their unstinting cooperation in organizing this event. So, so finally, I think uh, though we have a dwindled amount of participants at this moment, finally, my dear ladies and gentlemen of the audience, without your participation today, and active involvement, this conference would not have been a reality. So on behalf of the ISL, please accept my deep appreciation for you being here today. Okay, please have a nice evening and uh, good night. <laughs>